Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for participating in our webinar, Performance-Based Targets for Commercial New Construction, the Building Owner's Perspective. And hopefully everyone is are healthy and happy and had a chance to take a look at our polling question that we are going to start out the event with. So, can we see the results of our polling question? Okay. So it looks like in the answers we have 33% of you all who said yes you have, and then the others are no, and then we had 34% that had no answer. So hopefully you had a chance to take the question, because that will lead us into our discussion. And the agenda for today, we have three presenters. First, we're going to start off with Energy Star, and we're going to discuss the life cycle approach for using energy metrics to address performance targets. Then we're going to talk about these, how Slipstream is next. They're going to talk about designing and implementing performance-based procurement programs through utility energy efficiency offerings. And then finally, the Mayo Clinic are going to talk about how they use these targets to help them balance the aesthetics, performance, and budget for maximizing energy performance for their facilities. So let's meet the panelists. So today we have four PEs, or, inter or either engineering um, professionals. And first I'm going to introduce Travis Mohaki. He works for ICF, a contractor who works in support of Energy Star as well as he's also very familiar and very adept in energy analytics for design and construction. He's also um, worked with decision-making tools to help these building owners and architects um, develop energy performance targets and goals. Next is Lee Shaver. He is with Slipstream. Lee also works with energy meter design, program design, and analytics, and for performance-based procurement. And he's also doing research on electrification and decarbonization. Next is Brett Gordon. He is with Mayo Clinic. He's also a PE. He's section head of facilities management. And um, Brett is responsible for more than 14 million square feet of property for the clinic. And he will talk a bit more about his responsibilities as we go along. And then last but not least is Phil, who is the engineering infrastructure division of planning and design. He's a section head, and he is managing a 180,000 square foot research facility from design, from design and construction, and we'll hear a bit more about that as well. I am Karen Butler. I'm the architect in the room, and I currently work for the um, EPA, Energy Star Commercial Building Manager, and I uh, manage the Design to Earn Energy Star recognition activities, as well as instrumental for creating the target finder tool. So I'm going to do a quick chronology of what these are and how this all plays into energy performance and targets. So in 1999, it wasn't just the year we parted into Y2K, but it's the year that Energy Star created the target finder tool. This was um, grew out of a need for whole building performance targets to complement the activities that were going on with LEED and also the energy codes. Moving on to 2004, the Energy Star and Target Finder was actually embedded into the Portfolio Manager tool, which many of you may be familiar with, and now you can also keep your design um, energy numbers in the Portfolio Manager tool. We also launched the Design to Earn Energy Star Recognition, where building design projects are recognized by EPA for meeting the score of 75 or higher. Green Globes also came into the market during that time with their um, offerings. And at that time, they were actually using the Target Finder as one of their metrics to define energy. And then the EUI became part of the conversation. Many architects started um, addressing energy use intensity and looking at those targets in terms of their design activities. Moving to 2010, people became more aware of how energy efficiency were beginning to to be used to affect and manage and look at carbon reduction goals. Benchmarking and, and disclosure ordinance also became part of the um, conversation when cities and states 
started looking at the energy that commercial buildings are using and asking owners to report those uh, activities. Architecture 2030 and the AIA 2030 commitment also um, became part of the um, conversation and looking at how we need to reduce carbon emissions in commercial buildings for design. And then now moving to 2021, we're going to talk about performance-based targets, whole building targets, how these are being used to address um, energy efficiency and the actual performance of the building. And as benchmarking disclosure are beginning to take even more of a hold, now these um, entities are beginning to set targets that these buildings must meet in order not to be fined or having to do additional activity. So with that, I just have a few quotes from some industry activities or industry leaders. And the first one is the American Institute of Architects, understanding that it's becoming increasingly more important to connect building design expectations to actual performance. And then the Institute of Market Transformation, who have also been involved with benchmarking and disclosure activity, they're beginning to realize that this is a, a driving factor, but many of these designs are not being delivered with the um, performance metrics that they are expected to have. So the last one is a compilation of ideas that I just pulled from different readings. And it's like, it says that U.S. policymakers and industry leaders must work together to create a set of dynamic performance-based policies that enable rapid decarbonization throughout a building's life cycle by establishing performance-based expectations for new construction and building performance standards that set carbon and energy reduction targets for the existing building stock. So with that, I am going to now pass the baton over to Travis, who is going to tell us about Energy Star and its engagement with these activities. Travis? Thanks, Karen. Yeah, as Karen indicated, there are a number of trends in the building industry today that are driving the need to link building designs to their operational performance and hence provides a role for performance and outcome-based designs. Energy Star supports a similar process that connects building design expectations to actual building energy performance through the Energy Star life cycle. The life cycle includes a suite of Energy Star programs, tools, and resources that help building owners, architects, uh, engineers, and developers intentionally manage building energy performance from the design of commercial new construction projects through the ongoing building operation and maintenance. Before we get into the de details of the Energy Star lifecycle, I will cover how uh, the Design to Earn the Energy Star program supports performance and outcome-based designs. So first and foremost, Energy Star signals to the market the intent of superior energy performance. The performance recognized or the program recognizes building owners and their project teams for the design of commercial new construction projects that achieve an Energy Star score of 75 or better, indicating the building has been designed to operate with an energy performance in the top 25th percentile of similarly constructed buildings. In doing so, Energy Star enables building owners to establish design energy targets during the planning phase through a comparison of how similarly constructed buildings perform using the Energy Star score, energy use, and carbon emission metrics. Establishing a design energy goal from the onset encourages building owner involvement and commitment and fosters collaboration between the owner and architect early in the design process when most decisions affecting building energy performance are made and are cost effective. Energy Star uses the same suite of tools across this life cycle and thus enables the project team to link the energy performance of those early stage design decisions to long-term building operations, helping building owners get in front of existing building regulations. Once constructed, these same tools can be used by building owners to comply with state and local government benchmarking and carbon emission building performance standards. And finally, Energy Star provides a statistically robust and data-driven decision-making tool set and target finder and portfolio manager for evaluating, measuring, verifying, and documenting whole building energy performance and supports third-party verification and early recognition for commercial new construction projects. With that background, we'll briefly walk through the Energy Star lifecycle. The Energy Star lifecycle is an intentional process to integrate energy performance into project design from the start. It begins during the planning phase and continues through building operations, linking the energy goals for new construction projects to their operational performance once constructed. It is underpinned by the Energy Star suite of tools that enable the setting of uh, an establishment of design energy targets early in the design process, 
evaluating energy concepts that meet those targets at each stage of design, documenting the energy design intent within construction plans and specifications, recognizing achievement by applying to achieve the design to earn the ENERGY STAR certification, and assessing post-construction operations energy performance. Now we'll briefly unpack each of the five steps of the life cycle. Designing buildings is a complex undertaking and having clear and definitive goals from the start is critical to achieving successful outcomes. This step brings the building owner and the design team together around a common achievable energy performance goal. First, the building owner sets the tone for the energy performance by establishing initial energy targets during the RFP and planning phases using Energy Star's target finder or portfolio manager tools, as shown in the table, which enable comparison of the design Energy Star score, EUI, and carbon emission targets on the left to the same for the medium property on the right. Next, the building owner assembles a multidisciplinary team that includes representatives from all aspects of the project and adopts an integrated design approach. An energy champion is designated to prioritize energy and ensure it remains at the forefront of design through the or th forefront through the design process. And energy consultants and other project stakeholders that influence design construction operations are engaged to support the collaborative design effort. Once assembled, the project team participates in a design charrette to collectively discuss attainability of the energy target based on design concepts and strategies such as siting, orientation, form, frame, and passive strategies that achieve the balance between the building's program requirements and the project resources. This process reinforces the owner's commitment, achieves buy-in and accountability, and engages the design team around a common understanding of the project's energy goals. The greatest opportunity to incorporate cost-effective energy measures occurs early in the design process. This step enables building design teams to investigate, uh, access, and verify the energy performance of des building designs through an iterative process early and throughout each stage of design. Once the design energy target is established, Energy Star Target Finder and Portfolio Manager may be used in conjunction with whole building modeling to evaluate the performance of project design alternatives as shown in the figure, which compares two design alternatives on the left to the project's design target on the right. In the schematic design phase, for example, building models may be used to parametrically evaluate the performance of various passive building components, materials and systems that optimize the building's use of energy and minimize lighting and space heating and cooling loads. Energy performance may then be screened in Energy Star to assess performance compared to similar buildings and support the selection of building appropriate design solutions. Likewise, a similar process is repeated in design development where building modeling may be used to investigate and compare space heating and cooling system alternatives, for example. This iterative process of evaluating building systems and comparing their modeled outcomes in Energy Star to the energy design intent continues until one or more project designs meet or exceeds the energy performance target while also meeting the, program, the owner's other program requirements. Once the design energy meets or exceeds the energy target, the design team states the intended target in the project contract documents. During design, the project team documents the design energy intent by including the project's Energy Star Statement of Energy Design Intent or SETI document generated by Portfolio Manager or Target Finder and the Energy Star Specification Language for Commercial New Construction Projects into the construction document set. These performance specifications in conjunction with project specifications that detail the project's energy efficiency features, strategies, and construction methods support delivering operational energy performance that is aligned with project goals. Eligible commercial new construction projects with a 1 to 100 Energy Star design score of 75 or higher apply to achieve the design to earn the Energy Star certification at the completion of construction documents. Design projects that achieve certification receive recognition from EPA through marketing and promotional materials, press releases, internal communications, social media, and EPA's website. They share best practices by developing case studies to highlight their project's energy and carbon savings, and they use Energy Star certification mark on their drawings and promotional materials. And finally, step five. Once the building is constructed, the building owner verifies the building is meeting its design energy goals. This step promotes activities that lead to operational energy performance 
and the prospect of the building achieving the Energy Star certification for existing buildings. As part of the construction process, the building is commissioned to validate whole building performance relative to the building's energy design target, and Energy Star Portfolio Manager is used to compare energy performance of the design project to operations. As shown in the figure, monitor operational performance and apply for Energy Star certification. So as mentioned, you know, there's growing interest and in trends towards understanding the role and performance of outcome-based codes play in connecting building designs to operation, such that building designs have more predictable outcomes and those outcomes are in alignment with existing building regulations, such as state and local building performance standards. Because Energy Star's target finder and portfolio manager tools make use of the same algorithms and metrics, new construction building energy targets can be set during design and measured and validated post-occupancy, providing insight to how well building design is a good predictor of operational performance. With that in mind, EPA analyzed buildings that completed the Energy Star lifecycle and achieved both the design to earn the Energy Star certification for commercial new construction and the Energy Star certification for existing buildings. The analysis found that on average, buildings, once constructed, have higher operational EUIs than their design counterparts, as shown in the figure on the left. There is high correlation between design and operational EUIs, but design EUIs consistently understate operational performance, as can be seen by the scatter and regression plots on the right. Initial takeaways are that more could be done to improve and calibrate how building design estimates predict operational performance, specifically around the early stages of design when energy targets can be set and stakeholder input affecting operational performance can be obtained. And around evaluating energy design where energy modeling can be more flexible to assess real life operational performance under varying building operating conditions. To help building owners bridge the gap between energy design intent and operational performance, EPA is developing an Energy Star Design Guide document which will detail the suite of Energy Star tools and resources available for new construction projects as well as the Energy Star lifecycle discussed today. And finally, a few quick metrics. Since the program's launch, nearly 900 projects have been certified and recognized for design to earn the Energy Star, with an average Energy Star design score of 90, indicating the buildings on average have been designed to perform in the top 10th percentile of similarly constructed buildings, an average reduction of CO2 equivalent emissions of 42% compared to the median building. This includes more than 400 participating building owners, more than 100 million gross square foot of commercial new construction floor space across 13 commercial building property types. Of those buildings, more than 25% went on to achieve the Energy Star certification. I'll now turn it over to Karen. Thank you, Travis, that was excellent. And hopefully people can use that to um, help set targets for their building um, projects. And you also can use it to set targets for projects that are not um, eligible for Energy Star, but you can also go in and get an EUI. So with that, I'd like to also invite those of you who are attending this session that we are going to launch a challenge in uh, March to encourage people to turn in their projects for Design to Earn Energy Star. And um, we want to have a recognition event and to celebrate and showcase those projects and also to use this as a way to gain best practices and to help other people move toward moving, help people move toward performance-based targets. And then I also just got a little note that if you guys have questions as we go along, please be sure to put those into the chat window so that we can discuss those at the conclusion of the presentation. And with that, I am going to introduce Lee Shaver. He's going to talk about the activities that he is engaging with with Slipstream, and they have some exciting tools and activities. Um, Lee, do you want to take over now? Thanks for the intro, and thanks, Karen and Travis, for that uh, background on the Energy Star tool. Um, so I'm going to be talking about some work that we've been doing at uh, Slipstream. For those of you who haven't heard of us before, we are a nonprofit uh, doing work around building science and energy efficiency. We do research, technical assistance, financing, education, and uh, programs. Uh, I work mostly in the research area, but also dabble a little bit in programs, which is um, kind of the area we'll be talking about today. 
Um, so I want to take a step back and talk about um, why is performance-based procurement, why, why are we even having this conversation? Why is this a topic that's important to be talking about? Um, so DOE research indicates that high performance and cost-effective buildings are possible. So this plot on the screen is showing um, each dot is a building in Climate Zone 5 in four different cities. Are, these are all office buildings. Uh, and dots at the, the top of the screen are high, have a high EUI energy use intensity. And the lower down you go, uh, the lower their energy use intensity is. So this, this plot is showing buildings constructed from 1900 uh, through 2020. And you can see that whereas we might expect there to be a downward trend, newer buildings being higher energy performers, um, there's no clear discernible trend. Um, possibly half of the buildings are doing better than code compliance. Uh, very few buildings are getting below that green line, which is uh, considered to be achievable energy performance at market um, average costs, dollars per square foot. So performance is not improving. So that's why we got to think about how can we do better in that area. Um, so the National Renewable Energy Lab uh, several years ago was, was looking at this information and, and aware of this research, and they, they were at a point where they were going to be building some new facilities on their campus in Colorado, and they said, all right, how can we do better? Uh, so for this particular project, this is the research, research support facility uh, that's pictured there, they said, all right, let's let's think about a new way to do this. So they developed and piloted a performance-based procurement process of their own. Uh, and going through this process, they were able to achieve a LEED Platinum building. Uh, they hit their EUI target of 33 kBTU per square foot per year, uh, and it was constructed at a market average dollar per square foot. Actually, this project came in under budget and on time. Um, so they, they thought about how can we use this as an outreach program or an outreach opportunity. Uh, so first, they, they took this model for this particular facility and applied it to a number of other buildings uh, in their portfolio. Um, so the, the blue bars on this screen are NREL facilities, um, and that dollar figure is dollar per square foot. Um, every bar on this screen, every building is lead, gold, silver, or platinum. And you can see that those uh, five NREL facilities where they applied this performance-based procurement process still achieved the same, en same energy performance, but did so uh, at a much lower rate than the average um, building that was achieving LEED. So wh what was the difference? What was really the difference maker here? So they were thinking, okay, there's a couple of different ways that we can talk about what we want the energy performance of our building to to be when we're working with prospective uh, contractors, architect and engineering firms, and builders. So they said, we can ask for a sustainable building. Well, that's not very clear. All right, well, what if we say we need to see 30% savings over energy code? Um, that's a little clearer, uh, but it still is going to end up comparing simulated results to, uh, it, it'll be a comparison between two different simulations, um, which, Again, it's hard to verify how much energy you actually ended up saving as a result of that. So they said, all right, let's set an energy target. Um, and the easiest way to think about an EUI target or like this is um, we're all familiar with the concept of a zero energy building. Well, a zero energy building is a building with a target of zero. Um, so performance-based procurement is, okay, sometimes zero is not a reasonable, achievable project for a particular building. So let's set a target that is better than average and will be really good and, and achievable for this particular project. Um, and the key point of all of this is whichever one of these frameworks you use to talk about and target energy efficiency in, you, in your building, you can all do this on the same budget. Um, and a lot of times the we might think, okay, so if we're going to do it this way, this is going to take a lot more work. And in one sense, that's true. Coming up with that energy target, as, as Travis was talking about, um, coming up with that energy target is going to take more work. But that work is going to happen at the beginning of your planning process, and it's going to reduce the amount of time that you're spending making those decisions and adjusting things later on in the design process. So rather than trying to eke out some energy savings during the value engineering phase or redesigns, you've already got a firm target that you've 
done the hard work of setting at the beginning of the project. So those decisions become easier later on and take up less time in the project. Um, so after NREL had successfully gone through this process with a number of their own facilities, they said, okay, how can we turn this into something that others can use? How can we bring this to the market? Uh, recognizing that, you know, NREL folks are, are deep thinkers, they're very, they're very technically astute, and they said, okay, we want to make sure this isn't a process that doesn't require our level of knowledge and expertise. We want to translate this to a broader audience. Um, so that's when Slipstream partnered with NREL to uh, run this Department of Energy pilot. It was a, a three-year project that ran from 2015 to 2019 with a goal of uh, influencing 100 buildings. Uh, we ran a number of different pilots with the utilities that you see listed there on the screen. Uh, and we also did some work with um, the Mayo Clinic, who will uh, be speaking after I'm done here. So you can, you can hear a little bit more about their particular process. Um, so the goals of the Accelerate Performance uh, Project were first to develop tools, take all these innovations that NREL had developed uh, and turn them into tools uh, that others could use. Second step was to engage utilities, get some utilities that were interested in implementing this sort of process to enroll buildings in their territories. And finally, to create demand, to, um, come up with some best practices, some lessons learned, and, and help to create demand and interest in using this process uh, across the new construction market. So I'll go through each of those three steps quickly here. So a couple of the tools. So the first one is this EUI analyzer. This is the same tool that I used to make that chart that I shared at the beginning of the project. Um, very similar to uh, what Travis was showing us, this is a tool that allows you to look at the actual energy performance of different buildings. Uh, so right now this tool can pull in automatically uh, publicly available benchmarking data, and you can also go in and if you've got um, data about your own buildings, you can add them as individual data points. You can plot lines like the two lines we see here for um, Energy Star Score and the Architecture 2030 Challenge. Um, and it's a web-based tool. It's pretty simple and easy to use. Uh, so our, our goal in building this tool is to have something that uh, a group of stakeholders could pull up and look at in a room together as they're talking through the target setting process. Next up is the uh, Ripple Energy Modeling Tool. So um, a quick spoiler alert, this tool right now is not publicly available, um, but we are working on making this into something uh, that can be open to a broader audience. And actually in April, there's gonna be a part two to this webinar where my colleague Saranya is gonna be talking more about this tool. Uh, so hopefully folks who are interested will have the chance to, um, to attend that um, webinar as well. But the way that this tool works is, again, it's a, it's a web-based tool uh, for building very simple, straightforward energy models. We call them uh, shoebox models. Um, but the key innovation here, really two things, is it allows you to compare the impact of various different design choices. Um, so the example you can see on the screen, we see that um, some design choices around lighting have a very significant impact on the energy usage. But this particular building, we see that roof insulation, one of the, the the bars down near the bottom is not having a huge impact. So having a tool like this that can be changed on the fly can allow those stakeholders to focus their discussion on design choices that are gonna have the greatest impact for the energy um, of the building. Um, and it also allows you to uh, parametrically change things like building orientation, uh, aspect ratio, floor height. So the, the sorts of decisions that you can talk about in the, in the early design phases, but as the design progresses, those are things that can't be changed. Um, so being able to look at the energy impact of those choices uh, in an energy model at an early stage can be really valuable uh, when it comes to target setting. Uh, and then the last thing, and, and this turned out to be really, really a simple tool, but very effective was some RFP templates that separate the project goals around energy and, and other things as well, separate them into these three categories of mission critical, highly desirable, and if possible. Um, so when you include these in your RFP, you can be guaranteed that all of your responses coming back are, are going to include those mission critical goals uh, in their proposal for the project. And where you 
can start to see some differentiation and, and understand the expertise of the teams that are responding to those proposals is in how they propose to meet these highly desirable and if possible goals and how many of them they propose to meet. Uh, and what we saw through the pilot was that this is the area where um, where owners and, and developers are, are really scrutinizing those proposals to see who's going to be best, uh, who's going to be the best choice for a particular project. All right, so what are the takeaways? So we built these tools, we worked with a bunch of utilities, um, we got a whole bunch of buildings to engage in this process and go through it, and what, what do we find out? Um, so institutional owners are really a natural fit for this process. Um, NREL is an institutional owner and, and Mayo Clinic that you're going to hear from later on is as well. Uh, it's really a natural fit there because you have a essentially a developer who is going to be owning and occupying that building um, for its lifetime. Uh, so they, they, have a, they have a vested interest in this process. Um, where it might not initially seem as natural of a fit is in real estate development and commercial real estate. But we found that there's a lot of ways that this makes, uh, makes for a really great fit there as well. Um, one of the key things is that aspect of, of reducing owner job burden. So coming up with an energy target early in design is perhaps a new concept for a lot of developers, and it does take a little while to figure out a good way to do that, and it can take some effort to choose those targets. Um, but once you've gone through the exercise a few times, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, and now the burden of being a sustainable building and meeting an energy target uh, is shifted to the design team and to the contractors. Uh, and it'll actually reduce the job burden of the, of the developer, which is a huge benefit. And then, of course, um, there's going to be reduced operational costs. Um, once the building is live, which um, can be a significant selling point for potential tenants. So we're going to look at one quick case study. This was the first building uh, that we worked with for this project, uh, and given the, the life cycle of these buildings, it was one of the first uh, that we are actually able to get um, actual usage data from to, to verify if they met their target. So this, uh, this is a dorm building at the University of Chicago, uh, and they set an energy target of 75 kBTU. Uh, and in 2017, we got a full year worth of, of post-occupancy data and found that they hit that target uh, just under, actually, at 74.3. So that was a really great example of, of hitting that target. And um, the chart there, you can see that we actually compared the heating degree days and cooling degree days from the model uh, that was built to set that target to the actual heating and cooling degree days for that year of um, that first year of occupancy to make sure that there wasn't some strange outside factor that was uh, influencing the results. Uh, and one really interesting fact about this building, and, and I think uh, a, a great example of performance-based procurement in practice is um, this building was being designed about uh, eight to 10 years ago. And at the time, the cost of LED lighting had not come down to the point that it has come down to today. Uh, so they ended up using uh, fluorescent lighting in this facility. Uh, they decided that the expense of going to LED uh, was not worth it because it would require them to make other sacrifices in the project. So they went with fluorescent lighting on an aggressive daylighting and occupancy control schedule. Uh, and they took a slightly more innovative approach and ended up using natural ventilation uh, to reduce some of the other costs and energy um, usage in this building. So just a, just a small example, and, and Mayo Clinic's going to give a, another great example of, of how this process uh, can drive some of these innovative uh, design choices. Thank you very much, um, <clears throat> Lee. That was excellent. And it also drives home the point of not only meeting your target, but, con but continuing to benchmark and monitor the performance for the life of that project. So that leads us very nicely into our next presenter, which is going to be Brett Gordon and Phil Planka, and they're going to share with you the activities that they're doing at the Mayo Clinic and also a new construction project that they have on the boards. Okay, Brett? Hey, Karen, can you hear me okay? All good. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about um, a project that we did here at Mayo Clinic and, and uh, how we applied this performance-based design and construction method. 
Uh, just really quick, Mayo Clinic is a, um, a national healthcare organization. Um, we have three destination sites across the country. So um, Scottsdale and Phoenix, Arizona, as you see on the map, Jacksonville, Florida, and our Rochester campus, which is where the project that the projects that we're going to talk about today, that's where they took place. And we also have our Mayo Clinic Health System, which has several sites across southern Minnesota and western Wisconsin. So our Rochester site really has three campuses, our, our main campus on the downtown campus, which is outpatient um, and research and education, our Mayo Clinic Hospital, St. Mary's campus, which is about half a mile west of our downtown campus, and then our Methodist Hospital campus, which is really right uh, adjacent to our downtown campus. So like I said, Mayo Clinic is an integrated medical center providing comprehensive diagnosis and treatment in virtually every medical and surgical specialty. So just to give you a little context, we have about 34,000 employees um, on our Rochester campuses. And as Karen mentioned, it's about 14 million square feet of heated and cooled space, but if you include our parking ramps, it, it gets up over 21 million square feet in all. Um, stewardship has been has long been one of our core values at Mayo Clinic, so sustain and reinvest in our mission and extended communities by wisely managing our human, natural, and material resources. And that that's what leads right into our the, the basis for our energy conservation program. So I just just to give a little background, we've been down this journey for quite some time. Uh, really started with our baseline year of 2010. Um, and you can see EUI has been really our, our primary metric um, around this program. We've done various things such as retro commissioning and projects. And we do take credit for new construction, major remodels, additions as part of trying to lower our EUI. And we've, been, we've, we've had good success over the last 10 years of decreasing that over 20% now. And as you can see, the, the um, avoided costs really add up over time. So the project we're, I'm going to be talking about here today took, took place on our St. Mary's campus. This is a view of that. Uh, down in the lower left-hand corner there is the General's building. Um, this, is a, this campus is a primarily hospital space. It's uh, about 3.5 million square feet in all. Here's a picture, another picture of that. Uh, of the general's facility. So what the project entails was a vertical expansion on top of an existing facility that was built back in, I think, in the, roughly in the 1980s. Uh, we were going to add three new floors, about 150,000 square feet. Um, our project team, our project managers, Karen Finneman Killinger, construction manager, Mike Craven, and then myself and Ken Potts as, uh, as subject matter experts on the project. So uh, prior to, I guess it was just really good timing, uh, Slipstream came to us uh, you know, quite a few years ago with this concept and idea around performance-based procurement and asked if uh, there were any, if we had any opportunities we thought might be a good pilot project. And um, as luck would have it, we had the, we were just in the, um, I would say really early planning stages of this general expansion project. So we pitched this to Karen and Mike and the, and the team, and um, they were very supportive. Um, they know about our con energy conservation program and were very supportive of, of uh, trying this out. So Slipstream helped us out to um, work on this performance goal for this project. And, and because being the first time, how would we come up with a a goal and how we know if it's if it's uh, aggressive enough but not too much. Um, how is it going to affect the cost of the building? All those sorts of questions. Um, they also helped us with the uh, RFP templates, if you will. The uh, you know how do we send out that request for proposal and include the right things. So on this slide, you can see the the way we went up went about getting this uh, um, the goal. As, uh, as Lee mentioned, and I think this is a tool that uh, they helped us with, you know, and this is, they've, they've got some even better tools now today, but we looked at benchmark data across, across the, uh, you know, using 
I think Energy Star and other sources. So industry benchmarks, you know, inpatient areas, 205 kbqs per square foot. Outpatient, 95. We've got a little bit of both in this building, this project. So we took, you know, based on the building square footage or the areas in the project and averaged that out. Um, and we came out with this 122 kbqs per square foot. Now I noted, I noted at the bottom here, during the design of the project, it actually was, the goal was modified down to 81.6. We, um, the institution decided not to fit out all of the space, so a lot of shelled space, and to the design team's credit, they, um, they said, well, we need to lower that target then and, and meet that. So what was really, uh, you know, something that was new for us um, was the ener energy modeling for a, a project like this. I think all all of our design firms, of course, that we've worked with, they do some they have to do some sort of you know load and, and sizing calculations, and they probably do a certain level of energy modeling, but never to this this level of detail, I don't think. And what this did is it really helped create some or give us a tool to help make really good decisions early on in the process. So like I said, this that target was put into the request for proposal for all the design firms. Um, as Lee mentioned, they, they were very excited to, um, to respond to that. And you could tell during the interview process that they all were wanted to show their capabilities in helping us reach our goals. Some of the energy efficiency measures that were looked at um, through the energy modeling uh, were, you know, a lot of the a lot of the things that we had already mentioned, low U factor and solar heat gain coefficient for the windows, lower lighting power density, daylighting controls, high efficiency fans, premium efficiency pumps with variable frequency drives, uh, exhaust air, heat recovery, um, use of VAV systems and air side economizer and supply temperature reset, uh, dedicated outside air systems, and high efficiency roof with R30 insulation. Um, I think I, I should probably mention our campus, I don't know if you could tell in that picture, but we have a central utility plant for that campus with, you know, where we distribute steam, chilled water, and electricity all from the plant. So this building did not have, you know, all of these EUI numbers are really just site-based. So um, it's not like we could just put in a more efficient boiler or more efficient chiller or anything like that. We really had to look at the building envelope and the controls and the systems within the building. One of the interesting things that came out of this through the design process was how the exterior envelope uh, came about. The original, you know, the first pass at the, at the design from the architects and the design team was a a curtain wall, basically a you know a glass box, if you will, of the whole uh, addition. And when we looked at the EUI for that, for a you know a standard curtain wall on all sides, we were looking at 138. That's in conjunction with all of the other uh, mechanical systems efficiencies we could incorporate. So we weren't going to meet the goal. Um, so how could we make that better? Well, they looked at okay, we could do triple glazed curtain wall all the way around and the uh, and that got the EUI down to 125 showing on the energy model um, the the caveat to that is obviously as you can see here the capital costs associated with that that's the highest capital cost option not to mention we're building on top of an existing facility and we had structural uh, implications for that heavy of a curtain wall so then at the design team came back with a um, the idea of some rain screen, so a combination of curtain wall on the north side, which is advantageous, and on the east, uh, west, and south side, doing a combination of uh, glazing and rain screen, and that turned out to be the the lowest cost option as well as the lowest on the uh, EUI factor. So here's a here's a rendering of that. Uh, Exterior envelope solution, so you can see that north space turned out to be 55% vision glass and 45% spandrel. And then a, a rendering of the, uh, the final solution for the rain screen, so insulated metal panel system on the east, south, and west. And that turned out to be just 24% vision, 20% spandrel, 
and 56% mental panel. And I, another interesting fact that I, I think came out of this is um, this really fit really well into our, our campus as well, because if you look at our other buildings, we don't have that high of a percentage of window to wall ratio on our older buildings either. So I think from an architectural and aesthetic standpoint, it, it really uh, got us into a, a spot that, that fit really well with the whole campus plan. Now a really important aspect of this whole, this whole process is the measurement and verification. We did include in the in the design team to make them responsible for the for setting up and and uh, getting the plan together for for this performance and and the M and V plan. We wanted to make sure that they included in their design all of the metering and all the measuring that they felt would be necessary to not only measure the the energy associated with only those additional floors and the systems serving them, but also whatever they would need to also um, go back and troubleshoot if, if, for instance, they didn't meet the goal at the end of the 12 months. I guess I should back up. In the, um, in the contract for the design and the contract with the, for the construction management firm, uh, we have stipulations in there that there will be a 12-month measurement and ver verification period from the date of uh, occupancy. So then we will go back after 12 months and say, okay, what was that actual uh, performance and what is the EUI? Did we meet it? And if we didn't meet it, then it, it goes, we turn it back to the design team and the construction team and say, okay, can you uh, figure out where, where we're using too much energy compared to your model and your design? Is everything appropriate? And if, if not, or if everything is working the way it should and we're still not meeting it, what needs to change and how can we do that? So uh, this was a little bit challenging as we had the expansion going on to the top of the building, you know, existing infrastructure. So it included, this, this took a little extra metering on our part, but uh, well worth it um, in the end. So like I said, we wanted to measure only the energy consumed by those three floors. Uh, we have a, here at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, we have a, a really extensive networked metering system. So I think that was, uh, one advantage that we had already in process, we could pull data um, on a daily basis and send it to the project teams. Um, we, in this case, the design team was uh, HDR out of uh, Omaha, and we sent them uh, information daily so that they could put it into whatever tools they needed to use, um, but they were getting actual data from us for the building. The other, another really important part of this is with this UI being being part of the design, the planning, the construction, all the meetings, anytime something came up, um, you know, Lee mentioned um, the uh, you know value engineering we call it. Um, that that question always came up. Well, how does it affect the UI? Because everybody had it in their contract. It was an expectation, and and it was very it was great to always hear that conversation being had. But on the on on our side, the owner side, we also had to have our um, maintenance and operations teams at the table, so that they understood how the building was being designed, how it was being going to be controlled, and that we need to not um, do anything during, especially during that 12 month period. But really, moving forward, we want to make sure that we we maintain the facility so that it can can keep that performance over time. Here's just to show a few graphs. Um, from from our folks at HDR that we were working with. Um, much like um, Lee was showing, they tracked the heating degree days, cooling degree days versus their model just to make sure that there were no major anomalies in there. And it, it, I, this is tough to read, but um, we did meet our goal. You can see, I don't know if you can see it. We were actually around 72 kBTUs per square foot. Um, very low EUI for us um, in our building stock, especially the age of some of our buildings. But like I mentioned, a lot of the, the floor, a lot of the area, not a lot, but some of the area was uh, shelled space, but we did account for that when we uh, updated the target during design. So here's a picture of the, the facility after construction. Um, turned out very, very nice, uh, great project. You know, some of the keys to, to the success 
I believe are, we decided to commit very early uh, before, before even sending out uh, requests for proposals for design. And we, and we also included this in the construction manager at risk um, delivery process. And we integrated all the teams, the design team, the construction teams, our project management teams, and our facilities management teams. And another key aspect is this contract clause. We, there's a, and Phil will talk about this as well, the 2% the contract retainage. Um, it's payable after we have verified the successful 12 month um, period of operation. So I'm gonna turn it over to Phil and he's gonna talk about how we're um, applying this in, in the next uh, major pr project we have. All right, uh, thank you, Brett. And uh, as Brett mentioned, we learned a great deal uh, with the Generos building project. And with the success of the Generos building expansion, it became clear that building off of those experiences and some of the lessons learned, it could have a tremendous impact on our next major project. And what I'd like to do is share a few slides with you and some really high level details about this exciting project and some of the strategies uh, that have been identified with respect to energy performance in this building. As Brett described with the Generals Building Project, the Kellen Research Building Project, which I'll talk a little bit about, is following a similar planning path with respect to deciding early to incorporate an energy performance strategy and then borrowing the knowledge from this previous Generals Building Project. This began with us incorporating uh, the EUI target uh, within the initial A&E firm and construction manager at risk contracts and the RFP process. Um, just like the Generals building project, we had built in a 2% contract retainage for successfully meeting the EUI target after achieving uh, after achieving our 12 month testing period and uh, verification period. Within the contracts, we utilized uh, energy performance language and specific attachments uh, to the master contract to incorporate these details. And we also included very specific questions related to the EUI target during face-to-face -face interviews and the scoring of the A and E firm and uh, construction manager at risk uh, contracts. So on the slide here in front of you, I'd, I'd like to share a few brief details about the Kellen Research Building. Um, we have just completed the schematic design phase of planning. Again, on this project, in this case, it's HDR's Minneapolis office is providing uh, primary A&E design for the project and Knutson Construction uh, is, has been contracted at the, as the CM at risk. On the owner's side, I'm partnering with Brian Ellsworth and Josh Spaniel uh, from our Mayo Clinic Construction Management Group. I can't speak enough to how tremendously collaborative uh, of a team we have on this project, and it's, it's really gonna be critically important to successfully executing on these go the energy goals for this project. Uh, as listed on the slide here, we have established a, a 175 KBTU per gross square foot target. Uh, this target was established through discussions between uh, Brett, Gordon, and I, and we really heavily leveraged the Energy Star Portfolio Manager data uh, from our existing lab building benchmarks on the Rochester Mayo campus. Overall, this project will create approximately 178,000 BGSF of space uh, for use within the Mayo Clinic Research Shield. As you can see by the graphic on the left, the Kellen building will have uh, 10 floors and a mechanical penthouse above grade with a subway level for underground connections to adjacent uh, laboratory buildings uh, for use during our, uh, our mild winters. This project is also constructing three floors that will be shelled space to be fit out for future lab functions. On the right, you'll see a typical laboratory floor plate and uh, you'll notice that there's three zones. Uh, we have a research zone in the middle uh, with both wet and dry laboratory uh, functions, uh, equipment space, and also uh, lab support space. 
On the south side of the building, we have a support zone for the vertical conveyances, uh, mechanical and electrical risers. And uh, on the north side of the building, we have an office and collaborative zone on each floor. Of note, uh, and it's a little bit difficult to see in this slide, is that uh, the research zone is, is built symmetrically around a center core. And within that center core are the higher or the highest uh, levels of energy use and also of, of, of risk, of safety risks. And uh, that, that will make a bit more sense on the next slide. Uh, on this slide, uh, as I mentioned, we uh, have just completed the schematic design. And the a and &E firm, uh, in this case HDR, has identified a number of strategies in meeting this EOI target. Uh, the most important strategy is, is, is the concept of risk-based zoning, which I talked a bit about on the previous slide. We'll, we will have our highest energy use and highest risks at the center of the building, which is uh, shown there in purple. And then uh, adjacent to that, we have equipment spaces, and then we start moving into the more dry lab areas. And then ultimately on the perimeter of the building, we'll have more office-related space. And you'll see air flows as they cascade really to the highest areas where we have a large amount of exhaust. And uh, exhaust is, is, is a real energy challenge. And by using this risk-based zoning, uh, we'll be trying to minimize um, the amount of air that's, that's being exhausted from various spaces. In, in addition to the uh, risk-based zoning, we intend to use energy recovery through the use of an enthalpy wheel. Um, and then historically, we've had really great success with optimizing our fume hoods and our fume hood controls uh, to minimize the amount of energy being used. And then as listed in the Generos project, there are a number of strategies that uh, were employed on that project that will certainly be employed on on this project as we uh, continue through the design development phase. And then finally, as we have wrapped up our this schematic design, um, our design team still maintains a high level of confidence that we will be able to meet or exceed our EUI target that was established. And we look forward to meeting our goals when project construction completes in late 2023 or early 2024. So with that, I'll turn it back over, I think, to uh, Karen. Yes. Thank you so much, Bill. That was excellent. Um, thank you all for um, your, hold on, let me turn myself down and get the feedback out, for um, these excellent presentations. And it does my heart good to hear projects of this magnitude that are actually addressing performance targets. <laughs> And before I get carried away with the excitement of what I just saw, I have to do my little announcements. Um, for those of you who want to stay on board, we're going to do a Q&A with the panelists. And then also we are going to have another webinar where we're going to do a deeper dive and talk more about the tools that can be used and how those tools can be used to help to address some of the activity that were talked about in the um, projects that were presented by Mayo Clinic and also the tools and resources that um, um, Slipstream have for offer as well as Energy Star and kind of the integration of kind of using those all together. So I am going to um, go to my next slide and we will have our discussion with the panel.